good, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, David Farr. I'm an assistant professor of geospatial sciences, and I teach in a small suburb of Boulder called Denver. Um, and today, I want to talk about um, what happened, sort of the what happened around the new contributors and the Nepal earthquake in 2015. And really, my talk is designed around the issue of you know why do we care about data quality of online spatial data. I know there's been a lot of talks about data quality, but I, but I want to sort of talk about um, how, you know, obviously why it's important in a critical situation, but also how do we measure and how, why do we care about it. And so as an educator, I think about data quality a lot uh, I could, because I want to be able to teach my students what they need to know about spatial data quality. And so if you think about it as consumers, why do we care about the quality of data that we get? As data creators, and a lot of us in the room are data creators, actually all of us are always data creators, how do we ensure and communicate the quality of the data that we have? And as an instructor, I really think about, like I said, I really think about how do I teach spatial data quality to my students so that they understand the process and the key aspects. And of course, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, but back in the Bosnia conflict, the US bombed the Chinese embassy and they blamed it on spatial data quality. So I think it's, you know, lives are at risk to some extent and when we think about the quality of the data that we use. And so from an academic point of view, we sort of lump uh, data spatial or geospatial data quality into six characteristics, the lineage of the data, the history of the geographic data set, the accuracy, the, particularly the positional accuracy, how closely does the data represent uh, its true position on the ground. And then of course, attribute accuracy. Is it the thing that we say it is? Does it have the right characteristics? Logical, logical consistency, which is whether or not the, we, we are consistent in how we represent the data. Um, this is not from, open, not from OpenStreetMap, but I once downloaded a database of Starbucks locations. It was great because sometimes they labeled it Starbucks with a capital S, sometimes Starbucks with a lowercase s, Sometimes Starbucks is two words, and then my favorite was Starbucks with dollar signs instead of the S's. So logical cons consistency, how well do we sort of keep track of being consistent with our data? And completeness, do we have all the data that we need? And then finally, the usage, purpose, and constraints. What's the purpose of the data, who can use it, and what are the limitations of the data that we have? And then the last aspect, all geographic data, all spatial data has some sort of temporal quality, some aspect. It was either created for a particular time, it was created at a particular time, or it's only good for a particular time. And so that temporal quality is something we don't always think about, but it's important when we talk about data, particularly in the event of a crisis, because in the event of a humanitarian crisis, the temporal aspect of the data, when it was created and who, who created it and when, uh, uh, and how long is it good for is of critical importance. So we can get to talk about data quality in OpenStreetMap. Um, the traditional ways that we think about data quality in GIS change quite a bit. So the traditional ways are sort of either using ground data, ground truthing to look at the data, or to compare uh, against authoritative data sets. But a lot of research uh, in OpenStreetMaps has looked at uh, both how accurate is the data to other data sets, how accurate is the data to the, on the ground, but also the question of do more changes in OpenStreetMaps lead to more accurate data? And generally the, the case is yes, that the more times that a feature has been changed, the more accurate that, that, that feature is on the ground uh, in terms of positional accuracy. So that's sort of a unique way to measure the data quality of OpenStreetMap is to think about in general how, how many changes have uh, impacted the data how often has that change set been done so we have an idea of how accurate that data might be. And of course, in a crisis, maintaining reliable and accurate data uh, and giving it to relief workers is of utmost importance. It's a life or death matter. And so what I really am looking at is the 2015 earthquake, uh, the response, and how it prompted a crisis, and then a resolution and uh, OpenStreetMap and humanitarian, uh, and HOT humanitarian OpenStreetMap team so the paper today is about measuring the uh, earthquake and the number of mappers uh, and the increase in mapping activity, uh, the social and, and, and communication processes around the address, uh, around the increase to address the problem with the number of increased uh, users, 
And then uh, whether or not the novice mappers, the new mappers, increased uh, novel users, had a net positive or negative impact to the project. And so I'm sure many of you are involved, but a quick background, the Nepal earthquake hit uh, in April of 2015. There were around 8,000 uh, reported dead. There was widespread uh, damage across the country. Um, and uh, in, in addition to both Kathmandu, also many of the rural outlying areas, um, there was a huge relief effort that came in immediately from around the world, um, in both in terms of um, NGOs, international NGOs and relief agencies, and government responses. And not to get too much into the politics of it, but it was exacerbated by the fact that Nepal has been in a constitutional crisis uh, for about the past, for the previous year before that. So their government was not in a state to be able to respond effectively to the crisis. In addition, uh, Nepal has an amazing open street map program called Kathmandu Living Labs. And so they really took ownership of being the on the ground agency for working with one-on-one uh, -on -one with the relief agencies. They would print off maps on a daily basis for the Red Cross uh, as well as a uh, Doctors Without Borders to be able to give them up-to-date information as it came in, and they could also verify information on the ground. And so they were critical to this effort. Having that local relief agency already set up and running um, was, was pretty spectacular. And so if you look at the, the response around the world, you see it's actually a, a pretty incredible response. So uh, unfortunately, this, this chart is uh, logarithmic. But so that red box is the the date of the Nepal earthquake, and then I'm looking at the, res the number of people who mapped in Nepal for the 10 days prior and the number of people who mapped in Nepal for the 10 days after. And what those numbers, uh, it's hard, a little bit hard to read, but there's actually a tenfold increase in the amount of mapping activity in terms of the uh, changes and ads and deletes uh, ten, from the 10 days after pretty consistently to the 10 days before. So a huge response. Even more impressive, if you take all of the people who had mapped in, the, in Nepal, had added OpenStreetMap data in the previous 10 years of OpenStreetMaps back to the inception of OpenStreetMaps, there were about uh, 1,000 more users who joined after the 10 days, uh, after the earthquake, and started mapping. So there were more people who joined after OpenStreetMap, uh, after the earthquake, and mapped than there were in the previous history of mapping in Nepal. So the, the amount of response was pretty incredible uh, from around the world, and uh, which is great, except of course it also creates a problem. And that at the time, the infrastructure wasn't there to accommodate that widespread amount of new users. Um, and just sort of the, some of the discussions that were going on were thinking about, well, how do, we, how do we change what we're doing and who we're letting in? So there was, there was sort of one category of people who are interested in maybe making sure that we don't allow new mappers, novice mappers, who maybe don't understand the issues of data quality to map in the event of a crisis. And of course, then there was the opposite side of the group, the, the group that were saying, well, the whole point of OpenStreetMap is to be open, and we need to maintain its openness, but we need to have a way to both balance the open infrastructure and maintain that critical response. And so uh, there was a member who said, we have to adapt to an awesome contribution. We need more people. At the same time, we need to adapt in various ways to crowdsourcing as we are seeing problems arise. And so we saw a lot of messages come across on the, uh, the hot uh, email list with subject lines like, ARG, uh, just in terms of frustration. But I think it's also uh, a sign of the opportunity. And then from the new user, stat, uh, new user point of view, there was a, a user who wrote in saying, I'm a new, one of the newcomers. I'm not a GIS scientist, and I learned on the job. But it, however, I think I'm perfectly capable of making a contribution and that the OSM process isn't, isn't clear. So we'll talk about more. I'm sure many of you are aware of how hot adapted, but I will talk about that. But one of the first questions I wanted to understand is, did the new contributors have a generally positive or negative impact. And so if we actually look at the, the number of users before and after, users who had more experience, who had joined OpenStreetMap before the earthquake, in general contributed more on average. Um, but so uh, about twice, a little over twice as much on average than new users, which you might expect. Um, However, the percentage of features that were modified 
or deleted or changed was, was slightly higher in the more established users, the users who had joined OpenStreetMaps after than the ones who had joined before. So 20% for users who had joined after, or sorry, joined before the earthquake, 12% or almost 13% for those who had joined after. Now that's not a, that's not a strict measure of data quality, but it indicates that, that the problem might have been slightly over, overblown. Of course, there's also other issues with positional accuracy and data quality, which is that we don't know um, how inaccurate the data was. So was it a small change or a large change? But, but overall, there wasn't a substantive, a substantive difference in terms of, of uh, uh, in terms of the process of data, cha uh, data quality between older, user, older uh, users and newer users. And so, um, yeah, in, in general, a, a, much, uh, a, a much more active response. And so the solution from the humanitarian OpenStreetMaps team was both a social and technological change. The socially, they created a bunch of new resources, learnosm.org, um, and then having experienced reviewers check work, so now you have an option of being able to request work to be checked in the event of a mapathon. And then, and then a technical change of, of implementing the tasking manager, which is now in tasking manager version three, um, to, to provide specific instructions and guidance to users. And so that's been incredibly successful. We, for instance, in the recent hurricanes, we've seen that the amount of mapping activity has been much, much faster uh, in terms of response. And so really, I think what we see here is a classic example of a, of a crisis implementing change in both the technical side and the social side. And, and, and coming up with a new solution. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this today um, is, is that there are some very large potential humanitarian threats uh, that could be occurring. And so I think, it's, I think it may be time to start thinking about planning for the unthinkable, not, not trying to have a doom and gloom scenario, but I think it's uh, in terms of humanitarian threats today, in the world that we live in, in the political situation, I think it's a realistic idea to think about how do we respond in, in the number of disasters and the number of threats that we have, and even in the scale of threats that we have. Um, not, to end on a light, not to end on doom and gloom on a slightly lighter side, of course, uh, crisis is opportunity. Crisis is what makes things um, change and bloom and turn into something new. So I wanted to leave you there with that thought. Uh, don't be afraid of new contributors, but also that every time we come into a crisis, we come up with hopefully a better solution from our community. Thank you, that's my uh, time, questions?